Hello? Claire, are you there? I'm here and I'm unmuted. All right, me too. Hey. Welcome everyone to Chai Hack Night. This is episode 412. Uh, and tonight we're gonna be uh, bringing you an awesome presentation um, titled Beware of Tech Solutions to Policing and Prisons. Um, and we'll be having Victoria Law um, and Maya Shenwar, uh, the authors of that book, uh, here to talk about it. Um, and you can see here, we've got a, a, a nice hour planned out for you and beyond. Um, the, the live stream is started. Uh, Claire and I are gonna do some welcome and announcements. Then the presentation will happen in about five minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to Q and A um, for, from the audience. Um, Claire, you wanna say hi? And what's the next thing we gotta say? Yeah, um, hello everyone. So yeah, we hope you will uh, stick around after the presentation for a live Q and A and uh, very exciting civic hacking portion of the evening. We will be taking you also will taking your uh, live Q and A via our YouTube live chat. Um, so be thinking your questions during the presentation. And yeah, as a friendly reminder, uh, our code of conduct will be strictly enforced and we ask for your respect and consideration in posting appropriate questions. So now we're gonna do some uh, helpful announcements. I will uh, kick these announcements off. Please do. So upcoming presentations. Uh, the 8th of September, Jan Bren Jen Brandel, Election SOS. The uh, 15th of September, Victor Kovis, uh, Accessibility and Civic Tech. And then the 23rd of September, Adam Anderson of Amulet Health. So. Uh, Stay tuned and keep attending. Action Pack September. Yeah. Um, I'll take this one. So this is something we've been doing for a while now uh, and you can participate in it. Uh, we have started a tech and data help desk. Uh, it's not like a, t a, t a, d a help desk where you uh, ask for computer help, although we could help with that. Um, the idea is for uh, anybody, uh, organizations, individuals, companies, government folks, that are struggling to adapt to all of this online world um, and becoming sort of natively digital. Uh, this is a group of volunteers that Chai Hackney has put together to help any with any request that you have. The idea is that you have a simple question or you wanna get pointed in the right direction or get unstuck with a particular problem, this group's here to help. So you can request help on our Google form, the links uh, shown here at the bottom, bit.ly slash CHN help desk. Also, if you want to volunteer and be one of our, I think we have about 30 volunteers or so, uh, uh, and you want to help respond to some of the requests that come in, you can uh, fill out this other uh, form to become a volunteer. Um, so the links are there and we'll share those out on the website as well. Ooh, this looks exciting. Looks like some money might be available. Yeah, so, I can actually talk, talk about this if you want to take the next Oh, sure. Because I, yeah. I guess I added this one. <laughs> so, uh, Center for Tech and Civic Life, their uh, local nonprofit here in Chicago that help uh, election officials across the country uh, prepare for elections. They do ballot data, they do security, uh, and more uh, importantly, and most importantly right now, they're really helping a lot of election authorities figure out how to run an election during a pandemic. Uh, just announced, I believe it was yesterday, they got a $250 million grant uh, to help uh, regrant that money to local election officials. Um, so they're a great organization. They've presented here several times at Chai Hack Night before. Uh, and this is a pretty big, um, pretty big announcement from them. Okay, Code for America. So join Code for America's local chapter, Code for Chicago for 2020 National Day of Civic Hacking. It's on September 12th, 2020. You can go to codeforchicago.org to find out more. And then you've got the uh, link to join the meetup below. So uh, I did one of these years ago as a presenter. It was pretty fun. So yeah, think about going. Mm -hmm. You wanna do this one too? Oh, sure. Uh, so. Chicago 2021 budget survey, which city services should receive more funding, which services should be reduced to pay for. I think we've had some discussion about that stuff lately. 
uh, fill out the Chicago 2021 budget survey and you get to share your thoughts. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, so here are some links where you can fill out the survey. This is a survey monkey thing. So that's a pretty good chance to participate in what happens in your city. Absolutely. Yeah, we can share those links out as well since you probably won't remember them. <laughs> Uh, this one, I'll take this one. So uh, as you maybe know, there's an election coming up soon. Uh, and the state of Illinois uh, allows you to anyone to vote by mail, which is amazing. However, they will not send you a ballot unless you ask for one. And you must do so before October 29th. So uh, the links here are all depending on where you live. If you live in Chicago, there's a website, chicagoelections.gov. Uh, suburban Cook County has the Cook County clerk, um, the rest of Illinois, or if you have no idea, if you don't know where you live, but you know you live in Illinois, they made a website, IllinoisVotes2020.com, and that'll sort of route you to the right place. So fill that out and yeah, make sure to vote. I can see I just uh, applied to vote by mail today and it was, it was an easy process, so. Uh, so fill out your census um, because you count and you want to be counted and yeah, tell everyone you know to do it too. It looks like Chicago is still behind the national percentage at only 58.1%. So, and I think the deadline has been moved up. So yeah, that's the end of this please, month, I think. Please do that very soon because it does matter, even though some people may have been to try and discourage participation, please participate. All right, and then this is the last announcement, which is uh, after this live stream is over at around 8 p.m., we'll be having our post-presentation Zoom call. Uh, it's a separate uh, Zoom link that you can see here at the bottom, bottom of the screen, bit.ly, CHN Remote Zoom. We'll put that up at the end uh, as well. It's a place to have more of a participatory kind of uh, engagement with Chai Hack Night. We usually get about 20 people or so um, where we do some introductions and some small breakout group discussion. And then we split into breakout groups that uh, pe people are working on different projects and there's different learning groups that are happening. So if you're interested in, in that, we'll be uh, meeting tonight about eight o'clock. All right, well, I think that's it for announcements. So we're super excited to turn it over to our feature presenters, uh, Maya Shenoir and Victoria Law. Are you, are you both there? Yes. Excellent. Um, uh, you can turn on your cameras and uh, unmute yourselves and then Claire and I will fade into the background and let you take it away from here. So thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Maya, where are you? Hey, I thought you were going first. Okay. <laughs> mm. it's just I was just hanging back, but hi, right. I'm Maya. <laughs> Everybody wants to see what we look like before I take it away. All right, here we go. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Chai Hack Night, for having us. Thank you, Derek and Claire, for uh, organizing this. Um, Maya and I are the co-authors of a book that just came out last month called Prison by Any Other Name, The Harmful Consequences of Popular Reform. And when we wrote this book, we had no idea how timely it would become. Uh, and it would come out in this moment when people are talking about ways to defund and dismantle the police, ways to decrease prison populations, whether through decarceration or letting people out of prison or through abolition, uh, actually abolishing uh, the prison system. And our book looks at ways in which popularly proposed alternatives to incarceration including some technical solutions such as electronic monitoring and predictive policing, policing actually widen the net of incarceration into our homes and our neighborhoods and our communities. And we also look at ways in which other institutions, which are not necessarily carceral institutions, such as schools or child welfare systems, mimic the same logic of prisons. And we challenged people to think about what we need to keep ourselves and our communities not only safe, but allow ourselves to survive and thrive in this world. 
Uh, tonight, we'll be talking about two of the technical solutions that have been popularly put forth as alternatives to the brick and mortar prisons that currently hold 2.2 to 2.3 million people in prisons, including predictive policing and electronic monitoring. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Maya to start. Thanks, Vicki. Yeah, so right now we're in this moment where we're hearing a lot about police reform in response to the Black Lives Matter uprisings and the calls to defund police. But not all reforms are equally helpful and not all reforms are really responsive to the moment we're in, in which people are actually calling to defund the police. And in our book, Vicki and I talk about some of the police reforms that we see actually causing harm and expanding policing, expanding the prison industrial complex, as opposed to defunding or shrinking it. And so for this gathering, the piece of this that seems particularly relevant is the data related piece. So data driven policing is seen as a really positive reform in the mainstream to address the dangers of traditional policing. But really data driven policing comes with a lot of dangers of its own. So often data driven policing is referred to as preventive policing or predictive policing, as if you can kind of magically determine where violence or harm will happen in advance. And the mainstream logic kind of says that algorithms will be the thing that helps end mass incarceration and end racist arrests and police violence. And you can see this discussed everywhere from the Harvard Law Review to mainstream newspapers around the country to you know mainstream conversations around policing with both Democrats and Republicans. And the idea is that data will help target the real bad guys instead of casting a very wide net of criminalization. So these database reforms are said to be about making policing smarter, getting it right by way of technology. And in particular, the hype is saying that data-driven policing is our route to eliminating racial bias from policing. Because I guess the idea is that people are racist, but data isn't racist, technology isn't racist. And that's a fiction, obviously, but it's a powerful one. There was an important report a couple of years ago from the Upturn, which is a policy analysis team, which outlines the history of predictive policing. And it points out that predictive policing is actually a marketing term. And this term was proliferated by companies like Predpol, which is the predictive policing software company. And Predpol and similar companies operate both place-based tools and person-based tools within predictive policing. And dozens of cities have either tried out these specific tools, PredPol's technology, or many, many more use older forms of crime hotspotting. And so thinking about place-based tools first, there's been this practice for a long time of crime hotspotting. So predicting which areas will be the areas that crime will take place, and then deploying more police officers to those neighborhoods. So that's a type of so-called predictive policing in itself. And then PredPol takes that to the next level using really a massive amount of historical arrest data and also observational data, like data from just stopping people in neighborhoods, observing people in neighborhoods, and taking all that data to supposedly predict very specific times and places that crime is going to happen. 
And then there are also person-based tools like gang databases. And in Chicago until very recently, we had the strategic subject list, which was supposed to predict not only which people would perpetrate gun violence, but also which people would be victims of gun violence. And independent research showed that it did not work at all. It did not predict any such thing, but it did put a lot of people and particularly black people at further risk of arrest, police targeting and targeting by ICE and other agencies. So the list goes on. And that strategic subjects list persisted for about seven years. It was only decommissioned this past January. And we still have gang databases in this city. We still have the criminal enterprise database. So that's something we can talk about more later if, if folks want. So all of these predictive policing tools are held up as race neutral. So the idea being that it's data, data can't be racist, but of course the data itself is a product of racism. It all goes back to who has been stopped in the past, who's been arrested in the past, who has been incarcerated in the past. And of course, police are most likely to have targeted and arrested black and brown people in low income communities. So these are the places and the people who continue to be targeted and recriminalized because of this data-driven policing in part. So just as an example, 95% of people listed in Chicago's gang databases are Black or Latinx. And in New York, I think when they did this, this survey a couple of years ago, 99% of people who were added to the database were people of color. And these databases just get bigger and bigger because very often people aren't taken off of them. So New York's database doubled in size over the course of a decade. And we've also seen Chicago's database grow very large and they continue to be almost entirely made up of people of color. But still they're held up as this tool to combat racial bias. And I wanna mention that another reform that continues to be promoted as an antidote to police violence is community policing. And community policing and data-driven policing work hand in hand. So in part, community policing just means putting more police in communities, just in an effort to get to know people, which of course we know does not work. It inevitably means more police contact, which means more surveillance and more stops. And the way in which that ties in with data policing is that more stops, more surveillance produces more data about who and where people are. And some of the people that we interviewed for our book who were subjects of gang policing and predictive policing said they noticed so-called community police officers just standing there looking at them and taking notes. So that becomes data. And <clears throat> one more facet of community policing that also ties in with this data policing involves recruiting people in the community to become the eyes and ears of the police through neighborhood watch programs. So in mixed race neighborhoods, especially this means recruiting white people and also property owners, older residents, and asking them to spy on their neighbors, basically. And all of that surveillance that community members are bringing back to the police, all those phone calls about so-called suspicious behavior and all of the biases that come with them, that becomes data. And so in our book, we, we quote a former NYPD officer who actually acknowledged that predictive policing is a way to rationalize racially disparate policing. That was what he said directly. And he was saying this uncritically, like 
as if there will always be race, racial disparities in policing. So it's necessary to find kind of new justifications for it. And that's what data-driven policing has become in many cases. It's become a justification that basically entrenches the racist status quo. <laughs> so I'll, I'll turn it over to Vicki to talk about electronic monitoring, but I also think if we have time during our Q&A, one of the things we might be able to get into is other kinds of databases like sex offense registries that actually make data public so that anyone can see it, anyone can kind of become a vigilante who, who uses that data to seek people out and inflict violence. So we need to think about the ethics behind all of this data collection and the way it gets deployed and how it's used to perpetuate all different kinds of state violence. Thanks, Maya. So I'm going to talk about the other side of the equation, the tech solution for in response to calls to decrease people inside physical jails and prisons, so the brick and mortar prisons. So electronic monitoring, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, um, is a form of surveillance in which somebody is shackled to or has a giant bracelet put usually on their ankle, um, an ankle monitor with a GPS device which can track where they are at any given time. And it's usually accompanied by home confinement. So you are not allowed to leave your house without prior permission. It is not the same as shelter at home, which many of us have been doing for a long, long time now. Because with shelter at home, if you run out of toilet paper, you can decide to put on a mask and brave the outdoors and go to the supermarket. But under electronic monitoring, every step you take outside of your house has to be pre-approved often by often as much as a week pre prior to you leaving your house by either uh, the local sheriff or the electronic monitoring company or a probation officer, depending on the jurisdiction that you're in. And so you need pre-approval to go to the grocery store. You need pre-approval to go seek medical care. You need pre-approval to go pick your children up from school and you have to submit a list of where you are going to go and what time you are going to go. So say you, you submit a list and the list includes at 8.30 a.m. on Saturday, I plan to go to the supermarket on 3rd Street to go pick up my groceries. And I, assume, and I anticipate being back by, in my house by nine o'clock. And you get to that supermarket and especially during the early days of the pandemic, you realize there is no toilet paper, there's no bread, there's no milk, there's no pasta. Uh, the shelves have been picked bare. Under electronic monitoring, you cannot go to another store to go see if you can pick up these supplies for your house or your family. You have to then go back home. And if you do violate any of these pre-approvals, you are threatened and often do get sent back to jail or to prison. So this is a form, a way in which this popular alternative to incarceration then just transforms somebody's home and community into a prison itself. Uh, there are about 200,000 people on electronic monitoring, although nobody keeps national statistics. So this is just piecemeal data that has been put together. Um, and that number has grown 140% between 2005 and 2015. Now, lest you think, well, these are people who would be in prison. Otherwise, we also have to remember that electronic monitoring widens the net. So people who might not otherwise have been sent to jail or sent to prison are now being released on electronic monitoring. For instance, we see this in Chicago, which now has over 3,100 people and has the largest pretrial population under electronic monitoring. And during the coronavirus pandemic, at the start of it, uh, Chicago judges were ordering people to be released from the jail, which had become a, an early hotspot of COVID, uh, so that that way they could avoid getting COVID. But instead of ordering them to be released to their homes where they could ride out the pandemic in the relative safety of their homes, they were ordering them released on electronic monitors. And so people who then were set, ordered released 
uh, ended up languishing in these jails because there were a lack of monitors because Cook County Jail ran out of monitors. And the same thing happened in Milwaukee and in other jurisdictions. Again, if there had not been this technical fix, people might have just been released to go home and wait out the coronavirus and come back to court when courts reopened and it was safe to do so instead of being held because of the lack of this technological fix. Um, we see the same thing in ICE detention. Prior to 2004, immigrants would be released from detention under an immigrant supervision program, which connected them with resources such as housing, legal assistance, translation services. And then ICE contracted with an electronic monitoring company called BI Incorporated to provide electronic monitors for people who would be released. And now instead of getting out under this program that connected them to resources, people were shackled to an ankle monitor and had their movements restricted or not offered resources and uh, were released from detention. And now they're on electronic monitoring. And this has not reduced the number of people in detention. It has instead just been another way to uh, to keep people under some sort of surveillance and coercive control. Last year, ICE detained roughly 50,000 people on any given night. Uh, this is way up from Obama's staggeringly high numbers of 38 to 40,000 people. And there's another 38 to 40,000 immigrants under electronic monitoring. So this has not decreased the number of people under some sort of supervision and coercive control. And then finally, in many cases, electronic monitoring also involves fines and fees. So not only are you restricted to your house, threatened with jail or prison if you leave your house without permission, even to go seek emergency medical care for yourself or your family, or to do things that you would normally be able to do when you are out and at home, but instead uh, are told that if you do something, you will go to prison. Um, you're also saddled with the cost of your monitoring. So many places impose a fee, not to the jurisdiction that has ordered you to be on electronic monitoring, but on the person being monitored. And there's the threat of either being sent to jail for failure to pay, or in some instances, having your sentence extended um, if you can't pay. But then with each week that goes on, you'll pay. Uh, you pay even more. So we, we interviewed one woman who had been sentenced to electronic monitoring for about three years. And she had been told that the cost of her electronic monitoring would be $115 per week. And she started to fall behind on her payments. She was unable to find work in her small town because of her electronic monitor. Her husband had to take on the full brunt of the family's financial uh, responsibilities. Fortunately, she had a spouse who was working. Um, so she fell behind on payments. And when it came time for her sentence to be up, she was told that she had not finished her sentence because she had not paid that amount of money. So her sentence would be extended until she could pay off the balance, which by then had been with something like $9,000. But she would continue to have to pay $115 a week during that time. So it just kept adding up and adding up and adding up. And she was finally able to get off. But at great cost to herself and as well as to her loved ones and her family. And then in, other, in some cases, people also have to wear a drug or alcohol monitor so that probation officers or monitoring officers can gauge whether or not you are imbibing in drugs or alcohol, even if substances did not play a role in why you, are, you were arrested or charged. And of course, in many other cases, people have to submit to and pay for drug tests, which can be up to $60 per test. So electronic monitoring, while it might sound like a nicer, kinder, gentler, more humane alternative, you're not in a crowded dorm, you're not in a COVID-filled cell, you don't have correction officers coming and forcing you to stand up and recite your state ID number at all hours of the night. It is not a solution as to why um, it is not a solution to society's ills. Instead, it's another way to shift the responsibility onto the individual person while still not providing for any of the fixes that we actually need for people to survive and thrive. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I want to pick up just briefly on what Vicky mentioned about some of the additional ways that people are being monitored either while they're on electronic monitoring or separately. So Vicky mentioned that as technology has become more of a part of home confinement and probation, it's collecting more and more metrics. So at first a monitor just beeped at you when you got out of a certain radius. And then it became a GPS tracking device monitoring where you go. And now we also have alcohol and drug monitoring devices that are also common. And I wanna to add to this that we also see some of this more intensive monitoring happening in realms that are not explicitly the criminal legal system, but that could become part of the criminal legal system in the future if we're not careful. So this is one of the things that Vicki and I talk about in our book, how there aren't like really clear cut lines around what is policing or what is prison, because we see these institutions extending into our schools, extending into our communities, extending into our homes, and also extending into the medical system. So one example that I wanna mention is internet-based medication tracking technology. So the first digital, digitally tracked pill was approved in 2017 by the FDA. And by digitally tracked, I mean, this is a drug, it's a psychiatric drug that comes with a digital sensor on it that tells whoever is programmed to receive this information whether the patient has ingested it. And this first digitally tracked pill is a form of Abilify, which some people might know as a psychiatric medication. And the digitally tracked version is called Abilify MySight. And this medication is generally used to treat schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And so it's a strong drug that is used to alter someone's thinking and behavior to a certain extent. And in the hands of courts, that could have very serious implications. And Vicki and I talk a lot in our book and elsewhere about the ways that the medical institutions and the institutions of policing and prison overlap in this country. So we have court mandated drug treatment, court mandated psychiatric treatment, institutionalization, we have all that already. So already there are many situations in prison and in inpatient and outpatient treatment where people are coerced into taking medications that alter their bodies and their minds, which is a serious infringement on self-determination. So this digital tracking has the potential to take that a step further, basically making it easier to coerce people into giving up their privacy. And so we see all kinds of troubling possibilities for the usage of pills like this, tracking like this more generally within the criminal legal system. And as far as we know, that particular thing is not playing out yet in the courts, but it's something to keep an eye on. And we're already seeing biometrics devices being used in the criminal legal system in, in really creepy ways. One quick example that came up recently there's a pilot project that's just starting in a county in Indiana in which people who are on parole wear electronic shackles, electronic monitors that collect all kinds of biometric data that are supposed to identify what they're calling stressful situations that might infer that people are at risk of returning to so-called criminal behavior. So these monitors are going to collect information in real time, like heart rates, stress biomarkers, um, also data from people's smartphones, like the pictures they take and where they go location wise. 
And then all that data is pushed into an AI system, which is supposed to make predictions about who's going to engage in so-called criminal behavior. And this is something that people in the community that's that's kind of looking at electronic monitoring are very aware of that these kind of pilot projects are underway. So we see how these biometrics measures can tie in with predictive policing and electronic monitoring, and then also become basically their own sphere of control and coercion. So that's what we've got. That's <laughs> That's just a little slice of our book, but those are some of the parts that we think relate most directly to technology. All right, thank you very much. Um, so we're gonna uh, open it up to questions. I see we already have a few in the live chat, but if folks want to start typing questions, we'll uh, try to get to them in the order that they were asked in the live chat. Um, so I've got a, a, a first question. Uh, so I know that you, you talked about parts of your book um, that relate to technologies, but I know there's another part of it that talks about alternatives to these systems and technologies we currently live with. Can you do talk about a little bit about what some of those alternatives look like? Sure. Um, so one of the things that we asked, one of the questions we asked everybody that we interviewed that had been on some sort of coercive uh, popular alternative to prison, uh, to incarceration, whether it was electronic monitoring or had been victims of community or, or predictive policing or something else was what would have, what should have happened instead? And so the first thing we need to think about is, are these solutions widening the net? So if you are placed on electronic monitoring for something that is ridiculously dumb, stupid, and did not harm anybody, should that actually be a criminalized act and should you be punished for it in the first place? So one, one of the resounding answers we heard was nothing. You know, If you are targeted for being a black trans woman and you are swept up into a sex worker diversion program and then forced to go through all sorts of hoops and programs, should you, you know, uh, why shouldn't you just be allowed to walk down the street and live your life? And not be swept up into any sort of program. Um, but some of the other initiatives and projects that we, we highlight and we talk about in our chapter on solutions looks at ways in which communities have come together to figure out what their needs are and then how to meet them, particularly around safety. Uh, so we interviewed Jiris Dixon, who was one of the co-founders of the Safe Neighborhoods Campaign in Brooklyn. Uh, and they're uh, spurred on by the fact that in central Brooklyn, it's a mostly African-American and Afro-Caribbean population. So there's a high propensity of police violence already. People know they can't call police uh, and expect to find safety there. But they also, uh, for many queer and trans people, they also know that there is a lot of queer and trans violence. And so a young gay man one day left home and did not come home. And later on, pieces of his body were found throughout Brooklyn. So the community came together and said, what can we do to address violence if we can't rely on police to keep us safe, but we also know that interpersonal violence is, a really, is, is real. Like we can't pretend that it doesn't exist and that certain people are not more targeted because of their presentation. And this was not a short, easy answer. It's not as quick as you pick up the phone, you call 911 and you say, you know, there's a problem on that corner. And then you hang up the phone and you go about your business. Uh, it was a year, a year and a half of community meetings, people talking about uh, possible ways, pop possible solutions. Um, and what they came up with was something called the Safe Neighborhoods Campaign, which is uh, volunteers went around to different businesses. So these would be places on the street and they would say like, would you be willing to be part of this safe neighborhoods campaign where you provide a safe space for queer and trans people in the community, for everybody, but also knowing that sometimes people don't recognize anti-queer or anti-trans violence as it's escalating. And uh, they offered to do a de-escalation training with employees and business owners. Uh, 
they would recognize like what signs were of escalating violence, how to spot anti-queer and anti-trans harassment. So instead of just being like, oh, whatever, you know, th that group of kids is harassing this trans woman, you know, but sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can't hurt me. They would then say like, oh, wait, I should nip this in the bud now and say, hey, you can't talk like that in this pizzeria, you know, or, you know, like something to make it known like this is not okay before it can escalate. Um, and then they were also taught de-escalation techniques so that that way, if it looked like violence was increasing, they, were, um, they would be able to step in and de-escalate. And then they were given a poster to put on their window. So people who felt that they were unsafe knew to look for, you know, a storefront on the street level that they could duck into and somebody would be there to help them. So this is one of the ways in which the community brainstormed, what can we do? You know, and what are the things that keep us safe, um, knowing that they faced violence from both the police and also from certain people in the community as well. Thank you. You want to do the next one, Claire? Uh, so you mentioned a number of data sources that you used in writing this book. Uh, how did you get access and how did you analyze them? So most of what we did, because we're journalists, <laughs> so most of what we did was actually just interviewing people. So I guess making our own data. <laughs> and, you know, we cited studies we did in the predictive policing chapter. We looked at the work that Upturn had done. We looked at the work that Center for Media Justice had done and others. We Charge Genocide did did some things around community policing and its tie-ins with predictive policing and data analysis. Um, Project NIA did a, a great report uh, that analyzed some of the data around policing in relation to young people. But yeah, I mean, for our book, like especially as we got toward you know the solutions end, but also kind of looking at the human element of it, a lot of what we were interested in was you know how does this impact human beings like beyond the numbers and so that was that was a lot of the work that we were doing and i think we also um some of the people we interviewed so we weren't only interviewing people who had been directly impacted by violent policing and and prisons and prison alternatives we also interviewed a lot of people who had done work around like the you know kind of the academic side and the research side of this and so so yeah that's where we were coming from we didn't actually go in and analyze data sets ourselves for the most part okay i can take the next one there's a, we actually got a couple of questions from the audience around community policing um so could you define what good community policing is, or are there any good forms of community policing? So, you think? Should... Okay. so I think that there's two things to think about. Like, so, so when we think, so when the police departments say community policing, they mean police officers go into the community and they're supposed to be there in the community day after day after day with the idea that if you get to know somebody, uh, and the community gets to know you, they're more likely to come to you with their problems. You're less likely to shoot them. Um, you know, like, and, and everything will be like the like idealistic 1950s, you know, like uh, sitcom where like officer friendly walks down the block and says hello to everybody. What we see in reality is that, especially in communities of color is that police are deployed there and they act as if they're an occupying armed force. Uh, they, they are not necessarily there to say hello to all the little old ladies, you know, like play basketball with the kids. They're there to say, as Maya said earlier, collect data, you know, like these three kids hang out on this corner all the time. Perhaps without the context of there aren't any parks and community centers and rec centers in this neighborhood. Um, or, you know, these five kids, you know, go there. Uh, so, and as we've seen with the murder of George Floyd by Derek Chauvin, who worked in the same bar as him, getting to know somebody does not necessarily mean 
that you are not going to uh, harm them or brutalize them or kill them. It does not, it's not a safeguard necessarily from, from that. So, so to answer, like, so if you were to ask, is there any good form of community policing run by the police? I would say no. Um, and I think I can speak for both me and Maya on that. But if we think about ways in which we keep our community safe, you know, and not think of it as policing, like, no, 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 you didn't wear your mask properly, you know, like you didn't, you know, uh, you didn't hold your kid's hand crossing the street, you blah, blah, blah. Um, we can think about what do we need to keep each other safe? You know, what are the ways in which, uh, like the Safe Neighborhoods campaign, you know, said not, we are going to go stand with baseball bats and chase away people that we deem as undesirables, but what can we do to make sure that people in our community are safe? So I think it's helpful to think of it not as community policing, but what promotes community safety. Yeah, agreed. And I wanted to add as a resource on that, there's a really good article that came out of Minneapolis after the initial uprisings around George Floyd's murder. And the article is called How to Keep Your Neighborhood Watch from Becoming a Police Squad. And it really outlines a lot of the differences between doing actual community building work that can prevent violence and policing, you know, and not only in terms of involving the police, but in terms of doing policing ourselves, which, which can also happen. And another resource is there was a great pilot project that was run by Rachel Herzing, who we interviewed for our book, who also co-founded Critical Resistance, and it's called Build the Block. And she kind of, she kind of built a model that, you know, people would look to as, okay, this is what you do that would be community building as opposed to community policing in the service of how do you respond to violence. And just one example of what they did was within this certain radius, a certain community she was working with, they created a neighborhood directory of everyone in the neighborhood. So their contact information, all of those things, but also what skills could they bring to bear in an emergency or just in a situation around safety, related to safety. And so they had people on the list that were paramedics that said, hey, I'm willing to help if, if you don't wanna call 911 and this is a situation I could help. They had people on the list who had different language skills that they could bring. They had people on the list who were trained in de-escalation, they could bring that. And then on the directory, they also had people listing their needs. So people saying, hey, I live with an elderly parent. I am away from my house for long stretches of time because I also live someplace else, you know, things like that. And so building a system that could actually do some of these things that we're talking about in terms of like prevention, which is kind of a, a myth or a fiction when it comes to data, but actually is something that you can do in your community if you got to know your neighbors and build some of these systems. Thank you. Okay. Uh, what does the lobbying landscape look like on these issues? Uh, the questioner says, I wouldn't be surprised if private companies are pitching these solutions with no real counter weight policy wise. I think th there is a lot of lobbying. Um, many of the, especially with private companies, uh, private companies, uh, for instance, BI Incorporated was bought by Geo Group. So like, uh, which is one of the largest private prison contractors in the world. So uh, we see these companies move from the business of keeping people in physical cages, whether it's you know jails, prisons, immigration detention centers, to also expanding into these alternatives because there is money to be made um, from these. And then at the same time, we also see lobbying from things like police unions, right? Like anytime there's a call to defund the police, the police come out in full force, you know, they're lobbying, they're talking about this, that, and the other. 
and then they slow walk everything so that they're like, well, if you want to defund us, we're not going to respond to any of these, you know, complaints that we have right now, which should actually just make the argument that they are unnecessary because you're not responding to things anyway. So we do see a lot of lobbying happen. Um, I also want to be clearer for our viewers that when we're talking about private companies, even though I did talk about the profit motive in electronic monitoring, we also have to remember that when we think about mass incarceration and mass criminalization, private companies see this glittering giant behemoth and say, how can I make money off of it? But they're not necessarily the drivers of keeping 2.2 or 2.3 million people in prison. They're just parasites that come to feed at the trough, you know, and be like, okay, you know, what piece of this giant pie can I get? So I think we have time for maybe one more, maybe two, depending. Um, another audience question is that you'd mentioned you had no idea how timely your book would be when it came out. Are there any particular aspects that are sticking out to you or addendums that you would make to the book if you could? Well, that's interesting. Like, I think that, so when we started writing this book, Obama was still president <laughs> and we actually had to rewrite our initial introduction because we, and I think this was my fault because I'm really bad at prediction, by the way. <laughs> um, I thought Hillary Clinton was gonna win. So we, we wrote the introduction kind of like, in opposition to neoliberalism and like some of the reform possibilities coming out of what the Democrats were doing and then obviously needed to switch gears. Um, so yeah, this, this book evolved like from a different political landscape, but it did evolve in part out of the Black Lives Matter movement that was going on, you know, back in 2014, 2015 and how some of these seeds were planted that showed that a lot of people were actually open to radical change and even prison and policing abolition. And now that has really come to fruition. And in even mainstream conversations, people are talking about abolition, which is sort of the point that our book is revolving around. Um, thinking about like, would we have written it differently? Aside from kind of the cosmetic stuff, like thinking about like, well, we would introduce things in the context of the present moment. I think I might, um, and I can't speak for Vicky, but think kind of more boldly about what people are willing to embrace and not assume that like, okay, <laughs> abolition is gonna be the thing that we build up to at the very end where like, you know, people, some people will come around to that point. And we do introduce it throughout the book, but I think we came into it with the assumption that this book was actually not going to appeal to a super wide audience. You know, like we talked about it as like the thing people would read after they, like learn about prisons and how terrible they are and how they need to be abolished, you know, and then come around to that and then they can read our book. Whereas now a lot of the requests and a lot of the feedback we've been getting is from very mainstream sources actually, who have come to this place super quickly over the past few months of being open to not only abolishing buildings called prisons, but also really taking into consideration policing and, and all of the things that come with it and all of the extensions. And so, yeah, I mean, I think in a way I'd want to think about like <laughs> being, taking, taking readers seriously in a way that acknowledged that like these ideas are not niche. These ideas are for, for everybody. Great, thank you. Well, it is about eight o'clock. And so it's time I think for us to wrap up. So I just wanna say thank you again for your time tonight and presenting on your book uh, and answering our questions, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks for having us. So Claire, we're gonna switch gears to the more civic hacking portion of the evening. 
Um, we have, uh, as I mentioned before, a Slack, um, or sorry, a, a Zoom call that we're going to be uh, joining um, uh, starting about now. Um, you can also join our Slack channel, um, slackme.chihacknight.org. Uh, tonight's broadcast will be, is being recorded and it'll be put up um, on our YouTube channel shortly. Um, so you can uh, share this and watch it later. Anything else that we got, Claire? I think that might be it, except for what we do every week. Which we do every week, which is our catchphrase. So thanks, thanks everybody, and go forth and hack. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.